as we um, get ready to continue our study through the book of Acts. We've been in the book of Acts 37 weeks. I hope you're learning. Are you learning? Growing in your knowledge of how God kicked the church off and some of these wonderful uh, characters that we've learned to grow, love, and appreciate. And we're now uh, in Ephesus. We are in Ephesus. The Apostle Paul is there. Let me just refresh your memory. We're going to finish up chapter 19 tonight. Last week, we, we were in Ephesus, and we talked about the miracles that happened under the Apostle Paul's ministry. The first half of chapter 19 talks about the miracles in Ephesus, and the last half talks about the riot in Eph Ephesus. So, let me just re recap real quickly what we saw. We saw supernatural phenomenon happening in Paul's ministry as he is planting this church in Ephesus. So, last week we saw, for example, tongues and prophecy, and we kind of walked you through how uh, both starting with the Jews in Jerusalem and then Judea, the Samaritans, and then the, the 12 Ephesians uh, had the, these experiences. They, they put their trust in Christ. They were baptized in water, and there was this evidence of tongues and prophecy that came upon them. Then there were extraordinary miracles that happened at Paul. Even they would take cloths. We saw this last, this is bizarre. And they would lay cloths on Paul, and the anointing of God would transfer into that cloth. They'd take it on and sick, lay it on sick people. They'd be healed, and demons would be cast out of people. And that was another thing that we saw, the casting out of demons. And uh, remember, the seven sons of Sceva said, this is pretty cool. We like this power. Let's do this. And they went to cast out a demon, and the demon said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the demon-possessed man attacked them, and they left naked and bleeding. So that's a bad day. And we talked about uh, that mir those miracles. But what was the fruit? What was the point? Was it just so Paul could have power for this power's sake, or just to lift up his ministry? No, we saw the fruit of the Spirit working through his ministry, and that holy fear came on the place. In Ephesus, there was this fear that came over the church and people, and the Lord's name was held in high honor, and people were confessing their sins. They were burning their idols, and the Word of God spread widely, and the Word of God grew in power. This is what happened as a result of the Spirit of God moving through the Apostle Paul's ministry. The gospel is preached the signs, these signs and wonders followed, and here's the fruit of it. Well, what happens next is often what happened in Paul's ministry. After the gospel was preached, fruit is born, a church is established, there would be uh, Satan irritated, agitated, and stirring up and causing a riot. So, wherever Paul's ministry was, there were two things that would happen. There was a revival, their church was born, and there was a riot. And so that's what we're going to take a look at tonight is the riot. It's a narrative. This is very much a story tonight. There's not a lot of doctrine to extract from this, like lastly. This is very much a story. Uh, but throughout the history of Christianity, we have been taught that the church thrives best when it's persecuted. And if you follow the history of the church, it started, of course, in the Mediterranean, in Israel, in Jerusalem, went to Judea, Samaria, and then the outermost parts of the earth. It went to Europe. And after it went to Europe, it jumped over here to North America. And now it's, right now, it's most prominent back in Asia, over in China, places like Africa and South America. And in those places we see where there is persecution rise up against the church, the true church does well. And it's no different here in Ephesus. The persecuted church confronts the world and grows in effect. A bold church is an effective church. And a bold church is a persecuted church. So a persecution and effectiveness, to some degree, go hand in hand. You know, it's, it's not necessarily a good thing if a, your community um, wants to hand out a bunch of awards to your church. 
That's not always a good thing. Now, should we help the community? Of course. Thank God for the food ministry that we have where we feed people. We're going to serve the community on June 12th. Come on, everybody. You're going to serve? We're going to serve. We are to do acts of kindness and wonderful things. But really, the job of the church, the light in the, every community, is to be the conscience of the community and not just the caregivers. Now, interestingly enough, through, throughout church history, care best happened be, because of the church, the first hospitals, the first universities, the first orphanages in the world came as a result of the church. Did you know that? But the church is not bound to a region of the world. The church spreads as the gospel is preached, regardless of what the culture looks like. But when we preach the gospel and stand for the truth of God, um, you're, we're not always going to be accepted. <laughs> That's what happened in the book of Acts. Now, I'm not saying don't be antisocial, don't be anti-community. No, we're to do everything we can to help the community. We are to be social. But as the conscience of the community, <laughs> we need to call things out that are inappropriate, that are sinful, and not kind of just play the game. And there's no other institution, organization that really has that calling to bring the truth to bear like the church. The preaching of the word always has two results. There is progress as the gospel is preached in the kingdom of God, and there is persecution from Satan. And we ought to expect that to happen. Now, let me just run through a few places where the church broke out in the book of Acts and, and um, see how Satan kind of counteracted the progress of the gospel, tried to stop it. In Jerusalem, Satan sent the opposition of organized religion, Judaism. In Antioch, it was the opposition of per personal prejudice and envy. In Lystra, it was the opposition of ignorant paganism. Among the Judaizers, wherever Paul went, it was the opposition of ceremonial legalism. In Philippi, remember, it was the opposition of angry sorcery. In Thessalonica, it was the opposition of political revolution. In Athens, it was the opposition of cultured hedonism. That means excessive seeking pleasure. In Corinth, it was the opposition, we just saw this recently, of philosophical skepticism. And in Ephesus, here's what we're going to see, it is the opposition of religious materialism. So, in the case of Ephesus, these three approaches of Satan came to bear on the church. There was a hardness to the gospel. There was a hypocrisy and a hatred, and you're going to see that tonight. And those were Paul's three particular, uh, Satan's rather, three particular ang angles of opposition towards the gospel that Paul preached. So, again, tonight's more of a narrative. We're going to see the story of how the riot breaks out in Ephesus. And I think this is very appropriate given what has happened in our country in the last year. Because we have seen riots in this country like we have not seen since the late 60s. So, what I want to show you tonight are three simple thoughts from the story. I want to show you the reasons for the riot. I want to show you the, the reaction of the rioters and the resolution of the riot. So, the reasons, the reaction, the resolution, the riot in Ephesus. So, let's start here with the reasons. This is Acts 19, 21 to 27. So after all this happened, after what happened? The miracles, the church growing, the Word of God spreading, fear coming upon the community, Paul decided it's time to go to the next place. He was always on the move. And so he decides he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to pass through Macedonia and Achaia. And after he's been there, he said, I must visit Rome. And we know that he did go to Rome. And actually, that was the last place he went before his martyrdom. So he sent two of his helpers ahead. Timothy, his beloved son in the faith, and Erastus to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. Okay, so there's the setting. And about that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. 
Now, the way is not just some cult of Christianity that started in the 70s. The way was how they referred to the church, the sect of Judaism, Christianity, they called the way. And so, there's a great disturbance about the way. And here was the problem. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought a lot of business to the craftsmen there. I said that the issue that Satan would use to cause the riot and stir things up was religious materialism. And so Demetrius is the catalyst. I mean, you know, in every riot, mob, there's always a catalyst. So, for example, last May, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, there was a catalyst. What was it? It was that police officer, Chauvin and George Floyd. That was the catalytic event. Our, our society was already under a lot of pressure with COVID and the lockdowns and the mandates. And then this act of injustice is, you know, plain to see on social media where this police officer kills George Floyd. That's the catalyst. And we're still seeing the results of that, as, of that catalytic event um, as we just celebrated that, that, well, you don't celebrate it, as we just recognize the one-year anniversary of George Floyd's death. But what happened as a result? Riots. Riots. Mobs. Burning. Looting. Uh, anger, right? This is the result of that catalytic event. Well, what happened here is um, their trade, their money was being affected. So what happens is Demetrius, who made silver shrines uh, of Artemis, brought a lot of business to the craftsmen there, and he called them together along with the workers in related trades, and he said, hey, listen, my friends, that we, we receive a good income from this business, from making these shrines, making these idols of Artemis. Artemis was the Greek goddess of hunting, the moon, and nature. And what's interesting, they built a temple here in Ephesus that was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Solomon's temple was one of them. Artemis' temple was another one of the ancient wonders of the world. It was built over a period, get this, of 220 years. They were working on this temple. And amazingly, it was built into the side of a hill. It could seat 30,000 people. And Ephesus, that city of about 250,000 people, quarter of a million people, thriving center of trade, people are constantly coming, everybody in the civilized world knew about Ephesus and the temple of Artemis, their goddess. And so it was so well known, they, they, were, con they were making bank. Have you ever gone to a foreign country and um, you're walking along one of the areas where there's market, where there's markets, and all the people come out to peddle their wares? Have you ever done that? Every country I've ever been, you find where the markets are. Often they're open air markets or they're street markets, and the vendors come out. They can tell you're an American, <laughs> and they think you got money. I'll never forget the first time I encountered this. I was in Lisboa. I was in Portugal, and um, I wanted to get Lisa a ring, and so I had this guy come. Oh no, this is real gold. Uh, I don't know. No, it's real gold. All right. So we finally we agree on a price. You know, you do the barter system. I buy it, I gave it, did I give it to you or did I buy that for me? <laughs> I don't remember. Here's what I remember, it turned green. <laughs> Point is this, there's always vendors looking for suckers. They want to sell their wares, that's how they make their living. When I was just in Israel last year, just before the lockdowns, I was up on top of the Mount of Olives and they had these... Um, these trinkets, these guys would come around, and they're making bank. Because, you know, they paid like 50 cents for these, and they're selling stuff for like 20 bucks. And, and I just was, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be the tourist. And, and I grabbed all these scarves. Remember those scarves? I bought all kinds of beautiful scarves. They probably cost a penny to make, and they sell them for like 20 bucks. And that's just how they make their money. And this is how Demetrius 
And all these craftsmen make their money. They make these little images of Artemis. They sell them. And they make a good income. They've got a good business. And so verse 26, now you see here how this fellow Paul has convinced and he's led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus. And in, practi- and in practically the whole province of Asia. So his reputation precedes him. Paul is turning people to the faith in Jesus. And what happens when you turn to Jesus? What do you do with your idols? You burn your idols. You turn from idols. And that's what's happening. So this is hitting them in the pocketbook. And he says that the gods made and by human hands, they're not gods at all. And so now he begins to point out the reasons that this, is, this was the catalytic speech that started the riot. And there's three things here. Number one, there is danger not only to our trade, our trade. That's the materialistic reason. It's about money. Our trade's going to lose its good name, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, the reputation who was worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. So what do we see here? We see a materialistic reason. We're losing money, so something's got to be done about this gospel and about this Paul. Because we can't lose money, right? They don't pay any attention to the fact that eternal souls are at stake. They're worried about their purse. What did Jesus say in Mark 8, 36? Listen, what does it profit if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? They don't see that. They don't understand the gospel. Luke 16, 13, Jesus said, listen, you can't serve God and money. There are only two gods in this world. You know, we say there's Allah and there's all the Hindu gods. Really, there's just two. There's God the creator and there's money. And Jesus said, you can't serve both. They all come down to one of those two. And so, truthfully, many a, many a person is in hell because they love money more than God. Look at Judas Iscariot. So there's a materialistic reason. Why did the riot start? Demetrius' speech, he's appealing to their trade, to their money. They don't, want, they don't want to lose cash. And then there's a religious reason also. He's appealing to their piety. Their God is being defamed. And they need to defend their goddess. And so, this, this temple, as I said before, was a really big deal. And so, they're challenging the majesty of Artemis, and so he's appealing to their pocketbook as well. And then, um, finally, there's a political reason, and that is that Ephesus was known by this temple. It was known to be this uh, religious center where the goddesses worshipped. The whole civilized world knew about it, so their reputation is on the line. You know, if Paul is going to come and the temple closes and we lose our trade and our money, we're not going to be known in this region. We're going to lose our power. This is like a big deal. We have got to do something about this Paul and stop this church and stop this gospel. So Christianity hits them. You know, when the gospel, it's leave your idols, love God, not money, live for, for his kingdom. You know, it, They're threatened in every way. Christianity hit them economically. It hit them religiously. It hit them politically. And so that's the reason the riot starts. And they all feel that very deeply. And uh, just just to relate, didn't you, especially when COVID first hit, didn't you feel it financially a little bit at first? You're like, yikes, what's going to happen? And then you, you lose some of your perceived uh, freedom, and, and you just get a little tense, right? It's like, what's going on here? And so you can see that this was kind of seeding in them, and they're, um, they're upset. And what I want you to see secondly, again, this is the narrative, the reasons, there was the money, and there was the religious part of it, and there was their, you know, their reputation. And so what happens is, um, there's a violent reaction. And here's what happens with mobs. This, here's what happens with riots. When they heard this, they were furious. I don't think there's ever been a riot that started where people weren't mad. Capital riot. I mean, those people, are, they're just mad. 
Government's overreaching, we're mad. George Floyd, racism, we're mad. So there, when mobs begin, reasoning kind of goes out the window. And what happens is there's this, like this collective psychology, socio, no, psychology that hits the mob, and they begin to collectively just feed off one another's negative anger, furiosity. They heard this. They're furious. They're taking money out of our businesses, out of our kids' mouths. We're going to lose face. They're going to defame our great goddess and ruin this city, and they're ticked. And they began shouting. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And so this spreads. Soon the whole city's in an uproar. I mean, this is Minneapolis. This is Portland, Oregon. All right, they're just, <laughs> city's in an uproar. It's on fire. People are just screaming. They're angry. They're mad. And so they seize Gaius and Aristarchus. Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And all of them rushed into the theater together, this massive theater. So they grab, they illegally seize people. They're all screaming. They're all shouting. I don't know if they're burning and looting, but this is getting scary. Mobs are scary. Rioting is scary. It's like reason goes out the window. And Paul wanted to appear before the crowd and calm them down, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him, don't go in the theater. And the assembly was in confusion. And that's the second thing we notice here, confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. <laughs> The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. And he motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, listen to this, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Can you imagine shouting something for two hours? Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. This kept shouting that. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis. I mean, they just... Massive thousands of people just screaming at the top of their lungs for two hours. These people, Gaius and Aristarchus and Alexander, must be freaked out. They're going to rip us from limb to limb. What's going to happen? But here, here's the reaction. There's two things I want you to see. One is anger, and the other is confusion. This mob psychology, this incendiary speech that's... That first they start out mad and they get furious, furious. When people are furious, they lose their sanity. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, anger is temporary insanity. Think about it. When, when your blood boils, you've had that happen, right? You feel, when you lose your temper, when you're furious, temporarily you're, you do not make wise decisions. Why? You're angry. So what happens in marriages. We get amped up, and then we just get insane. We just say stuff we, we never should have said. Same thing at work. You just... <laughs> Anger does not produce the righteous life that God desires. You know, if one of the, the fruit of the Spirit is temperance. It's peace, it's kindness, it's goodness. If you have an anger problem, the root of that really is spiritual. You're, you're walking in the flesh, not according to the Spirit. Believers are not to have fits of rage. You ought not be have a bunch of holes punched in your wall. Someone from somebody's hit a couple. But it's not right. Now, better that hit that than the dog... Most of the time. Those dogs can get you mad too. Anger. Now, there is a righteous indignation. We should hate evil. Literally, love must be sincere. Hate that which is evil. Cling to that which is good. But you ought not to be losing your temper, 
throwing stuff, cussing and cursing. That's an indication that something's wrong in the heart. Jesus said, out of your heart come these things, fits of rage, slander. You say, what do I do? That's me. I'm mad all the time. I cuss, I swear, I punch stuff, I scream, I holler, I see. What do I do? Well, try reading Galatians chapter 5. Learn to walk in the Spirit. You can overcome this. Your body is your body, and your mind is your mind. So even though these emotions might hit you and you feel that blood pressure going up, and step back from the situation, pray, and just make a choice to walk in the Spirit. And the time to engage is not when you're mad. (laughs) Almost no good decisions are ever made when you're furious. In marriage, you need to learn this skill. If you're both heated and you're just angry, just back away, resolve it later. Pray, work in the garden, take a walk, eat some ice cream cool off, then come and talk when you're not insane. They're mad. And that is the first characteristic of a riot. It's anger. Anger runs wild. Anger is irrational. Anger hurts people. Anger, uh, think of the people, the martyrs in the Scripture. What caused Stephen to be killed, the first martyr? People were furious at what he said. And they gnashed their teeth at him. They took stones and they threw it until they killed him. Anger is what happened in Christ. Remember, the people were so infuriated with Jesus. Who do you think you are, Jesus? What did they cry? Crucify him, crucify him. Screaming and yelling, carrying on. Listen, there's no, nothing wrong with peaceful protesting. But don't get involved in one of these protests where people are screaming and hating and throwing and burning. And <laughs> Amen. You guys are quiet. You're mad, aren't you? No. <laughs> What's the second reaction? It's confusion. Where there is confusion, there is evil work. You know, look at James, how he says it in James 4. The whole, there's... There's evil around. There's confusion. You know, when you're talking to somebody and if you get real confused by what's going on, something's wrong. Right? Because truth, there's a clarity to truth. And when you're arguing or when you're talking to somebody, if everything's like fuzzy and confused, something's wrong. Just recognize that. They're confused. The whole city's in chaos and disorder. So in their confusion, they start grabbing people. Gaius and Aristarchus and Alexander haul them into the theater. And Paul, of course, wants to confront them. That's Paul's nature. By the way, John Wesley, you've heard of John Wesley who started the Methodist church. He was very experienced with angry mobs in the UK. And he, he made this statement. He said, always look at a mob in the face. And Paul was, would have done that. He would have looked at them square ball in the eye and told them exactly what the truth is. And, but some Christians restrained him. Now, here's just a couple thoughts about the difference between faith and presumption when it comes to this area of protection in particular. It's faith to be in danger and believe God and ask God to deliver you. You're in danger. There's a problem. Uh, you're scared. Reach out to God, ask for deliverance, ask for protection, trust Him. That's one thing. That's a good thing. But presumption is this. Here's the difference. Presumption is to willingly put yourself in danger and then expect God to deliver you. That's presumptuous. See a motorcycle gang, "Ah, I'm going to share the gospel with them. Oh, you better pray about that first. Oh, God will take care of me. You go in there and get the snot beat out of you. (laughs) I did a funeral one time for uh, the exiles. (laughs) 
one of the exiles had died, and I went in there, and uh, I looked at him, and I was like, well, I'm going to preach the gospel because I'm in a safe building. I don't think they'll hurt me, but they weren't too happy. Some of them got up and left and crossed their arms, and um, they weren't too happy. But I'm not going to go out on the street unless God really prompts me and say, hey, you bunch of sinners, give up your tats, give up your drugs, give up your bikes, come follow me. Oh, oh, they'll follow me, all right? They'll beat the snot out of me is what they'll do. Now, I'm not saying if the Spirit prompts you, then that's one thing. But just to presume, you can go into a situation with 30,000 people rioting, totally with a, a mob philosophy, angry, confused, and think you're going to get away with That's probably presumption. I think the leaders here did the right thing by restraining Paul. All right, let's, let's wind this up here. I told you it was more of a narrative tonight. We're just telling the story, relaying it. We'll finish up right here. And then how did this riot come to a resolution? Let's look at that. It was the wisdom of one person, the city clerk, quieted the crowd and said this. Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus, is the, and the whole world did know, is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her, her image, which fell from heaven? Now, what some historians think this was, was literally a meteorite that had fallen to the earth, and they, they thought that this was um, sent from Artemis. So... To them, that was not disputable. This meteorite came, and they're like, this is, Ar- this is sent from Artemis, the goddess of nature. Her image fell from heaven. Therefore, these facts, they're undeniable. You guys all know this. You've been knowing this. Um, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. So here's someone who is not a believer, but who has some wisdom He has some political savvy. The city clerk probably ran the meetings here in the the city. And so he's like, okay, calm down. Don't do anything rash. Now, you have brought these men here, though they have. And notice that this is a testament to Christianity, right? They have not robbed temples. They're not thieves. Nor have they blasphemed our, our goddess. Their approach was not to come and talk bad about our goddess, so that was wisdom on Paul's part. He preached the truth. He, he lifted the gospel up. He exalted Jesus Christ. He didn't just go start tearing down their traditions and stealing from them. And no. Paul used to say, what we do, we do it openly so that every man can see. We do it honestly before God and before men. We just preach the truth. And so um, they had a good reputation, even though they were mad because they were losing money and all these converts are coming to Christ in Ephesus. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open. So there's laws here. There's courts. There's a way to handle this the right way. And I would just say that too, with particularly to those cities that are burning. And I don't, I don't hear quite as much about it as we did last year. Uh, or Antifa in Portland. Listen, that is never the right way to handle things. Right? Defy authority. Burn stuff rob innocent citizens, uh, steal. These are all sins. You're compounding the problem. You're not helping a thing. Why? Because you're mad and you're confused, like the riot here. That's not how the church operated. How did the church operate? The truth. Just tell the truth. And don't condemn everybody. They'll be convicted by the Holy Spirit You don't need to tear down their every little thing they're doing and nitpick them. Just hold the truth up. Live it. Preach it. And so the the guy says, listen, the courts are open and there are pro-counsels. They can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. By the way, that's thank God we have a country that is set up that way. If you have a grievance... Take it to the courts. Don't take matters into your own hands. We used to have a gentleman in the church who um, got into a, his family member got into a property dispute with someone else, and his uh, family member actually got killed because the the neighbor took a shovel and killed him. I mean, that's never the way to handle a property dispute. 
What do you do? Go to the courts. That's why we have the courts. That's why we have laws. Follow the laws. Amen. As it is, we're in danger of being charged with rioting because of what's happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there's no reason for it. He had a brain, didn't he? And after he had said this, what did he do? He dismissed the assembly. And they left. He calmed them down. Why? Because they listened. They finally listened to a voice of reason. And that's what we need to do is listen to voices of reason when you're angry and confused. So, um, that pretty much winds up Paul in Ephesus. And we can see the riot started because of their trade, their temple, and their reputation. Demetrius was the catalyst that kind of brought it about. And then we see the reaction to his speech to that catalytic moment was anger and confusion. And then someone speaks reason and the law into the situation and calms them down and diffuses it. And um, that winds up Acts chapter 19. Interesting, isn't it? Again, not a typical doctrinal passage. It's more a narrative. It's a story. Uh, but nonetheless, I, there's truth to be pulled and learned and gained and how we react um, to things that make us angry. Don't join a mob. Don't be part of a riot. Don't take matters into your own hands. It personally as well as collectively. Anyway, um, let me pray. And then uh, we've got one great song to end with here tonight. And I want to thank you for coming. Again, if you're a guest, make sure you hit the new here, start here tent. We have a gift for you. Thanks for joining us online tonight. Uh, just before I pray, let's throw up those ways that we can give here. Uh, I want to just remind you that's part of our worship to the Lord and to His kingdom is by giving Him the first and the best. So uh, the ways to do that, many people are giving online these days. Uh, whether through our app, we have a church app if you haven't downloaded that yet. Whether on an Apple platform or an Android platform, download the app. It's the easiest way to watch sermons probably. Uh, or our website, experiencetherock.church. Um, don't forget, we have serve day coming up on the 12th and vacation Bible school is coming exciting. All right, well, let me pray for you real quick, and then we're going to, we'll close it out in song. Father, I want to thank you for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Lord, I, I pray that we would learn um, from your word tonight regarding situations, particularly, Lord, in our country that make us angry. And let us follow the wisdom, Lord, that this clerk had, who wasn't even saved, who said, don't take matters into your own hands. Don't allow this anger and confusion to cause you to make rash decisions. Use the vehicle of the law. But Lord, I thank you that the church, regardless of the hostile situation or a favorable one, Lord, when that gospel is preached, lives are changed. And people come and see you. They come and they understand that they are in darkness and that they need a Savior and that Jesus is the one who has paid the price for our sins on the cross and the power of your Spirit is alive and risen from the dead. And Lord, that is the hope that we have, that in you, Jesus, our sins are forgiven and in you we are made new. Lord, we put our trust and our faith in you I thank you for your blood and the power of your sacrifice. We worship you, Lord, and I just pray that you would bless those that have joined us online, those that are here in the room as we go our separate ways tonight. That your favor and grace would be upon us in all our relationships and interactions this week. We love you, Jesus.